Welcome to Thrive. It's good to have you here today. It's been a long time uh, through this whole pandemic. And um, thank you for <laughs> putting up with everything and just all the ways that we've had to adjust our ministry in order to be where we are even today. And praying that God will have used all that we've gone through to bring us to even a better place for ministry and service. That we understand more the needs in our community. That we understand how God is still going to work through us. Maybe not in the ways that we want to have all the light and sh you know, shiny stuff going on in our lives. But uh, more effectively into the lives of people who are pretty broken and pretty tired and weary. And... We have a savior who says, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. We want this place to be that for many people in our community right now that are a little lost, a little confused, uh, shell-shocked at everything that's gone on, wondering whom to believe and what to trust and where to turn. And that's kind of our question today that we're talking about, by the way. We are in the seventh week of our series in the Gospel of John called Identity. And it's really, the question we're asking today is this, to whom do you turn? To whom do you turn? You know, when your car breaks down, to whom do you turn? I usually turn to Shaheen. He, <laughs> he's a mechanic. What? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you go to a mechanic. When you spike a fever, or when you're looking for a new job, or when you're struggling with anxiety, to whom do you turn? You know, you've got mechanics, but then you've got counselors and friends. You can turn to television or parents or siblings or experts or entertainers. A textbook? Or do you, like me, often just turn to Google? <laughs> to whom do you turn? When you face tragic news in your life, and that's kind of what we're dealing with today in our text from John chapter 20. When you face a need for clarity in the midst of chaos, to whom do you turn? You know, much of what happens in your life is not what happens in your life. <laughs> Did you catch that? Probably. Much of what happens in your life is not what happens to you in your life. It's to whom you turn when something happens to you in life. That makes all the difference, because mo everybody faces difficult times. Nobody has an easy, easy time at all. Suffering is universal. Disappointment happens, sadness, confusion, stress. We all have questions, all that stuff. The question is not whether that will happen, but to whom will you turn when it happens? That makes all the difference. And to whom you turn is really a question of identity. Today we're exploring the story of Mary Magdalene in John chapter 20, who at the grave of Jesus faces the greatest tragedy, difficulty, grief in her life. She has no answers. To whom does she turn? We'll find out in our text. But uh, by the way, we don't know that much about Mary Magdalene. Some people have speculated quite a bit, but it is like trying to put things together. What we do know are just a couple of references. One here in the Gospel of John is where she shows up at the, at the cross of Jesus Christ with the other women. And the, the beloved disciple, and Jesus speaks to them. She says not a word. But we know she's there with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and others. The only other time in the Gospels that we really have from the Gospels themselves a word about Mary Magdalene is in Luke chapter 8. And it says this, And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. So what we learn is that Jesus didn't just have 12, tell 12 men hanging around, but there were a lot of women and a contingent of people, and that two things about Mary Magdalene. One, she was, had been possessed by at least seven demons, and Jesus 
cleared her of those. And secondly, she and the other women were the ones um, financing the operation. Does that sound familiar, women? The men spend the money, but the, yeah. Uh, well, in this, yeah, so applicable, right? Yes. So that's all we know about Ma um, Mary Magdalene, actually. Now, you probably, have, oh, she was a pro, we have no idea if she was. Just saying. All that other stuff is speculation of adding unnamed people and women in different parts of the New Testament into her story. But as far as her story, those are the facts that we know. And then, this is the only time we get words out of Mary Magdalene's mouth in John chapter 20. So we're going to look at John 20 and verses 11 to 18. <clears throat> and this is um, the day of the resurrection. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. To whom will you turn? That word turn comes up twice in this text. First of all, in John chapter 20, verse 14, where, Jesus, where it says she turned around and saw Jesus but did not recognize that it was him. And then secondly, in John 20, 16, after Jesus cries out Mary, she turned toward him and cried out Rabboni. And that word is actually strepho in the Greek, which does mean to physically actually turn around or turn towards something. It can also mean to take a different path you know, to zig instead of zag. It can also mean, though, kind of a metaphorical way of an inward turn or a conversion on the inside of you. And so what we find out in this text, even though the word's only used twice, I think there's three turnings or things that are going on that make the whole difference. And John could have written this story in a number of ways. But John chose to write this story this way. He could have written the facts of the story that Mary was at the tomb and then Jesus met her and not brought up this. But I think he's writing the story this way with this word about turning and to whom she turns and how she recognizes and all that's going on to be what I would say is a paradigm or the way that it works for all of us. The way that it works for all of us to find who we really are and what our identity is. So in this story, we're going to look at three turnings. The first of all, toward the tomb. Secondly, the turning around. And thirdly, the turning out towards others. Now, the turn toward the tomb comes up, of course, in John 20, 11. Now, the word turning is not used here, but you can kind of see that she is focused on this tomb. It says, she stood outside the tomb crying, and as she wept, she bent over. She was inspecting the tomb, looking into the tomb, trying to make sense of this tragedy. She would not turn away from the death of her Savior, of her Messiah. She didn't deny the reality of the death of what Jesus went through. She wasn't about euphemisms like, well, you know, there's a, a silver cloud in every, you know, there's a, what, silver lining in every cloud, okay? No, she doesn't say stuff like that. She doesn't say, look, just look on the bright side of life, you know? She says that she saw the human brokenness, the tragedy before her, she doesn't turn away from it at all. The reality in the Bible is that death is not a friend. <laughs> It's the enemy of God. 
It's the one thing that God wants to defeat, and in fact, will put at the feet of Jesus on the last day. It is the last enemy to be defeated, the Bible says, but it is not a friend of God. It is not, it may be a tool that God uses at times, but it is no friend. Jesus came to conquer this death, but not by brute force, not by overcoming death, but being overcome by death itself, absorbing all its ugliness, all of its tragedies, all of its brokenness, all of its alienness to God's creation and taking it into himself, and it placed him in this tomb. I think sometimes people think religion is kind of... um, well, fantasy. It's an escape. It's a way to kind of go like, well, you know, this way you can try to color the world a different way than it actually is. And Christianity, and this turning to the tomb says, no, Christianity following Jesus is absolutely realistic. It does not cover over the tragedies in anyone's life. It's tough sometimes as a Christian. You know it. You face the same thing everybody else does, right? And it's not like, oh, yeah, no, cancer doesn't happen to Christians. <laughs> you know, or, or uh, you know, financial difficulties don't happen. Or, you know, God always just makes it turn out so wonderful. Um, he does, ultimately. But you've gone through hard times. They're really hard. They are really difficult. Christianity is realistic. It's not trying to create a fantasy world. We don't even talk about how life just keeps going on because it keeps going on, or that people, well, they're still alive in my memory, or all of that type of stuff that you hear. So often the euphemisms around the tragedy of death. We don't buy into that. We know God gives life. We know we brought death into this world through our rebellion. And we know the ultimate reality is that God will give life again, but death is still a real thing. Now, it might seem odd that you go like, why why is this even important that in the text, John, that I need to turn towards the tomb? Um, I think Dorothy Lee said it well. She said, the first step in turning towards God is knowing the reality of ourselves, the reality of ourselves. And um, <clears throat> that reality is nobody gets out of this world alive. Like, yes, there's resurrection. But unless Jesus returns, well, uh, and come quickly, Lord. <laughs> but um, I'm not getting out, you know. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher, said life has to be lived in retrospect. That is, you need to understand the end of your life, the, fr- the fragility of your life, the finiteness of your life, and understanding that be- so that you can live from now till then. You have to live it kind of backwards, knowing the meaning, the telos, the end goal of your life, and understanding that. Most people don't. don't. They just live one day after another, or they're amused by one thing or another. Dorothy Lee goes on and says, access to entertainment and consumerism, medication for the merest hint of pain, institutions and structures which push to the boundaries all that is bruised and disabled, funeral customs that are disembodied and cursory, all these can shield us from the pain of what it means to be human. Kind of keep trying. I think the world is trying to create a fantasy itself. That life is wonderful all the time, and as long as, and it can be wonderful, and your life will always be up, up, up. And if it's not, well, just, you know, try to think on the bright side of life and amuse yourself and find a medication and find this and find that and go off and do this and do that to distract yourself. Christianity is realistic. Life is filled with suffering and difficulties. The real issue is to whom you turn. And that's what happens in our second point. Mary turns around. She doesn't get stuck on herself. She doesn't try to make something up. She sees the death and brokenness of the empty tomb even. She doesn't know what that means. But she turns around and she sees Jesus. She doesn't recognize who he is right away. She assumes he's a gardener. And maybe 
she says in her mind, from what I can tell, maybe you know what's going on here because I don't have that information. Now, what you find out in the Gospels is often people mis have a mistaken identity on Jesus. They're not quite sure who he is. The disciples, you know, they're in on the Sea of Galilee in the midst of a storm, and they see Jesus walking on the water, and they say he's a ghost, mistaken identity. Others think, well, maybe he's John the Baptist risen from the dead, or Elijah, or another prophet. They're not quite sure. <laughs> the Pharisees uh, mistake his identity judgmentally and say, well, he's... He's Beelzebub himself, the Lord of the Flies, or he's a Samaritan, you know, kind of a racial slur against him, or he, hey, we don't know who your daddy is. That's what they say in, in John chapter 8. Mistaken identities. Here, Mary thinks he's the gardener. <laughs> and all these mistaken identities, by the way, are. Uh, within what we would logically come to some conclusion about. You know, what else would we know? It has to fit into the way things are. And Jesus is somebody who makes things totally different and the way things can be. In one sense, you know what's funny? I think John has some humor here, and you might not get this hint. In one sense, she's right. He is a gardener. In another sense, she's totally wrong. You go like, what? The first human being, Adam, what was his occupation? A gardener. He was to tend the garden. And ever since Adam and Eve fell, there has not been one fully human person on earth who is fully the way God intended them to be until Jesus shows up now in resurrected body. And he is not only the gardener, who is going to take this garden and create something beautiful. He's going to renew all of creation and restore it the way it was. He's the first truly, fully human being, once again, establishing a whole human race. But in another sense, she doesn't know any of that stuff. I think John kind of has that in the background a bit, maybe. She just thinks he's the gardener. He might have some information. Like I said at the beginning, I believe identity is to whom you will turn to whom you look for clarity or answers to questions. And so often, in my life, your life, I think we turn to gardeners. You know, newscasters, or celebrities, or athletes, or scholars, or professionals, or amateurs on any subject if we think they have some knowledge of something. And that's how we get uh, whatever decisions we make, you know? Uh, we turn often, and um, these days it seems like we're uh, avoiding all the um, actually uh, ruling class or intelligentsia or experts and turning just to social media, where I think what happens is we just pool our ignorance together, <laughs> our arrogance together, our rebelliousness together, and defiance together, and then we make up our minds just based on what everybody else is saying, even though they don't know what they're talking about, right? It's to whom you turn. That's where you find your identity. Klein Snodgrass said it this way, you cannot know yourself without knowing the one in whose image you were created. The problem with just turning to the gardener is that's never going to give you the final or ultimate answers in life. And God knows this for Mary, too. If she just goes to a gardener, she doesn't have anything. And that's why it's not that Mary turns and figures out who Jesus is. It is that Jesus shows up He's the one who turns to her, who sees her weeping, who comes to the tomb and speaks her name. He calls out to her. You know, he shows up not the way like Superman maybe at the end of the movie would show up, you know, you know, coming out of the sky with an airplane, you know, in his hands, landing just in time for the six o'clock news to say, hey, look at me and what I've done. He turns to her in a very personal way, and he doesn't even say, ta-da, here I am. He says, Mary. He calls her by name, her personal name. The God of life, the Lord of this universe, and the resurrection calls Mary her name. 
I love what Eugene Peterson writes about that. He says, at our birth, we are named, not numbered. I don't think any of you were numbered like, you know, number 12, <laughs> number 24B, you know, no. The name is that part of speech by which we are recognized as a person. We're not classified as a species of animal. We are not labeled as a compound of chemicals. We are not assessed for our economic potential and given a cash value. We are named. And we are named, what we are named is not significant as that we are named. I sometimes wonder why my parents called me John. I mean, it is pretty well so generic. Sometimes you just go like, there's so many Johns in this world. But it's still a name, right? And then he says, as well, Eugene goes on and says, no one can assess my significance by looking at the work that I do. No one can determine my worth by deciding the salary they will pay me. No one can know what is going on in my mind by examining my school transcripts. No one can know me by measuring me or weighing me or analyzing me. Call my name. And your name in the lips of your Savior is such a beautiful thing. Jesus calls Mary by name. And in so doing, he is saying, I am not some dead founder of some ethical religion that you just get to know through following some of the rules. I'm a living Savior who is alive right now, whom you can have a personal, intimate relationship with, who I long to have a relationship like that with you, and when you discover me, you will discover yourself and your identity and your purpose and your meaning in life. You know, our culture, as I've said, it's so obsessed right now with identity issues. We're not even sure who we are and how do we But I'll tell you one thing, everybody in our culture basically assumes the way you discover yourself is by discovering yourself. The way you find yourself is by finding yourself, by going inside of yourself and figuring out and let me tell you, when I go inside myself, I find feelings and desires that go in all sorts of contradictory directions. And I wonder who I am. But you keep supposedly, you're supposed to go into the well of yourself and find something at the bottom of the well. And of course, you can throw in a few personality tests and other things to make it sound scientific. But in the end, regardless, you're supposed to find yourself within. And I'll tell you, it's not going to work. We were created for a relationship with the God who made us and to center our lives around someone who adores us, someone who wants us, who shines his face on us. And when I am adored and beloved by him, that's when I know who I am. James Bruckner says, Christian identity at its center is grounded in whom you love and in who loves you. It's really a question of love. And Jesus says to Mary personally, I am, though the ultimate person in the entire universe has loved you with such great cost, I give my whole life to just speak your name. Mary knows who she is when she recognizes whose she is. So you turn around you turn around and you hear Jesus speak out your name. But it doesn't stop there in this text. There is a turn now toward others. Now, this section seems a little weird. If you read the text, Jesus says, don't, don't hold on to me because I haven't ascended to my father. It's almost like something's wrong or something's not quite finished with his resurrected body. It's like the paint hasn't quite dried. Don't touch me. But the word for don't touch or don't hold is actually the word to cling to. And what it seems like Mary is trying to do is to cling to the past, cling to what she had with Jesus as her rabbi before his death. And he's saying, everything has changed. <laughs> you try holding on to me now, it's like holding on to the tail of the tiger. I'm the one who's now in charge as Lord of the universe and life and death. Don't hold on to me. Oh, and tell your brothers what has happened and what you have found. And he has Mary then turn towards the community, towards others, and to give to them everything that he can to them. He comes to Mary when he could have passed by Mary and gone to the apostles. Isn't that amazing? 
Do you remember who Mary was? Mary is the person who had seven demons cast out of her. Now, if you know anything about demon possession in the New Testament times, um, it isn't a pretty sight. And that means a person is out of control of themselves. They are a puppet to the forces within them. They are crying out, lashing out. They often are self-mutilating and self-destructive. They're tortured, they're scarred, and they're scary to everyone around. And they are considered a totally a lost cause. And Jesus could have just skipped Mary at the tomb and gone to the disciples right away. But he deliberately chose to come to see Mary. And I think in that, he chooses not just this person who had been demon-possessed, but a woman, not a man, a reformed demoniac, not a seminary graduate, to tell you what the gospel is really all about. That your status is not based on your talent or pedigree or good works or morality. It's all about God's grace and the fact that he has turned to you. He calls you by name and he wants you. Mary would have never figured it out if Jesus hadn't already turned to her first. And then he says, here's the microcosm of the whole gospel, is don't hold on and just adore me. Go out and start sharing and serving and giving and being what I have called you to be, a witness to the resurrection. So the three turnings in our text. Turn to the brokenness of this world and see our own reality. Turning to Jesus, we find out who we really are in our identity. And then turn out to others and serve in his ministry. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for how you've been working in our lives. We pray, Lord God, um, that this pattern we see in Mary actually happens in our lives as well. We pray, Lord God, that you, Lord, would do um, this great turnaround for us all right now. We know a lot of us have seen the reality of the brokenness in this world right now, but we haven't seen the hope that you bring through your resurrection. I pray that that would start uh, really well, working in the lives of many people around us, Lord. And help us at Thrive to turn out to this community and world in such a way that, Lord God, um, well, you start changing many people's lives like you changed Mary that day. We lift up to you, Lord, those who need um, your healing care today. So we think of Karen, uh, who is in some pain. We pray your healing on her. We lift up to you, O Lord, and praise God for the gift of a new child to um, John and Haley Henahan. Lord, we thank you for Liam and his birth. We pray that you keep the whole family in your care right now, we re and we rejoice with them. And Lord God, um, we uh, lift up this community. Uh, we pray that our food drive would be such that it would uh, give you glory that uh, the needs of people would uh, truly be served. But they see more than just food. They find you, that they turn to you for every good thing. We lift up to you, Lord, that you would do um, exceeding and beyond, abundantly beyond all that we can ask or imagine. If we turn to ourselves, Lord, here at Thrive, there's not that much. But if we turn to you, Lord God, it's amazing what you can do. And so we ask that you would do such. All this we lift up to you, Lord Jesus, in your powerful name. Amen.